right, take your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter 5. Uh, children can be dismissed to Children's Church if you go to that. Luke chapter 5. We're going to be reading just a second, verses 17 to 25 of Luke chapter 5. I was thinking about this story that we're going to look at tonight. I'm trying to remember the first time I heard this story. My mind went back to a church very similar to this one, only much, much older, uh, probably in Massachusetts, a uh, dank basement, an old lady with a blue beehive haircut, and a flannel graph board. Anybody, anybody besides the Massachusetts part, anybody can relate to something like that. Uh, this, this was just one of those stories that as a children, as a children, as a child, okay, oh, there's only one of me, I wasn't using weird pronouns. Uh, <laughs> as a child, this is one of those stories that jumped out at me um, and stuck in my memory, and I'm sure it probably did for you as well. Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. It says, and it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, uh, men, uh, behold, let me start that again, and behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up uh, that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we think about this story, uh, this, this event that actually happened today, Lord. We pray that you'll help me uh, to preach clear and, uh, Lord, to, uh, to remember the things that I've been studying. And, Lord, I pray that you'll uh, make the point of this message uh, clear to the to hearts of your people, Lord, uh, that you'll stir us up, Lord, to action that you'll cause us to examine our own hearts and souls. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, this week, um, actually yesterday, uh, our oldest member of our church, Glenn Drummond, passed away. Glenn was uh, 95 years old. His children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and even his great-great-grandchildren are in our church. I think that's a pretty awesome legacy. Pretty rare. Um, but I got to thinking about Brother Glenn's age. At 95, Brother Glenn lived an exceptionally long life. And there are a few people that are remaining, those people that are his age that are left, uh, have seen more change in their lifetime than I think any generation in history. Um, Brother Glenn was 26 years old. Consider this. He was 26 years old before Elvis Presley came on the scene. When I was Noah's age, um, about 11, my favorite historical movie was Apollo 13. You guys remember that movie? Okay. And that was way back in history, Apollo 13. That movie, the events of that movie took place in 1970 when Brother Glenn was 41, which is my age right now. Um, Brother Glenn was in his 50s during the Reagan administration. He was past retirement age when Bill Clinton became president. He was already 77 years old when Facebook burst onto the scene in 2006. And through all of that, 
through his, through his many decades of life, Brother Glenn kept his wits. I mean, he was, just a few months ago, he was sharp as a tack. Actually, a few weeks ago, he was sharp as a tack. Um, I remember a few months ago sitting with him in the nursing home, and we were sitting in this room with just tons of stuff on the other side of the room, a, a large room, tons of stuff on the wall. And for some reason, we just started playing this game, like, who can read the small print furthest away? <laughs> he did not have glasses. I had my glasses on, and he destroyed me. And that, that man, till the day of his death, had amazing hearing and amazing vision in his 90s. Uh, I could remember everything. His memory was completely fine. Um, up until a few months ago, he was still fixing his own car and working on things around the house. Um, almost nobody gets to do that at that age. But sadly, a few months ago, he developed paralysis. Um, it was like he woke up one day and he could no longer control his arms and could no longer control his legs. And unfortunately, this made him extremely helpless. And for the last four months of his life, he could not do anything without someone's help. He could not feed himself. He could not use the restroom. Uh, he couldn't even change the show on a television without somebody else doing it for him. He was absolutely stuck and at the mercy of other people. And if you're wondering, he hated it, okay? He absolutely hated it. And he's in a better place today. Um, he is walking on streets of gold. He's reunited with many friends, family members that, that went on before. Um, but in our story today, we are talking about a man that was paralyzed. And I don't think I'm ever going to think of this story again without thinking of what Brother Glenn has gone through the last few weeks, the last few months. Um, I don't think I can think about paralysis the same way again, because uh, in paralysis, you are completely at the mercy of other people to take care of you. Jesus here, he's back at Capernaum. Remember the people of Capernaum tried to force him to stay? And he said, no, I have to preach to other people in other places. And now he's back at Capernaum. He's preaching and he's teaching there. And he's in a home. Uh, Warren Wearsby suggested this may have been Peter's house. I don't know. doesn't say that. But that's interesting to think about. He's in this house and he's preaching. And listen, this house is way past their occupancy limit. Okay? Uh, this is standing room only. This is like hundreds of people in a house, packed everywhere. And the text tells us something interesting. Look at verse 17. It says, There were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. So what's interesting is this is the first mention in the book of Luke of the Pharisees. Now, it's not going to be the last mention of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are mentioned at least 26 times by name in the book of Luke. Um, and really, if you know the Gospels, the Pharisees are the bad guys of the Gospels. They are the main antagonists in Jesus' ministry. But who were they? Well, the Pharisees, they were a group of conservative Bible preachers, conservative Bible teachers. During the time of Ezra, by the way, we're studying Ezra on Sunday nights, and it is fascinating. And so if you're interested in all in that time of, of history, Please come, all right? But during the time of Ezra, when the people of Judah returned from exile, um, when they returned from Babylon, one of the things that happened is they had this national revival. And as part of that revival, they made a pledge that they would never again, as a people, go into idolatry. They would live by the law of God. They were going to be people of the book. And out of that revival came this group of preachers and teachers that called themselves the separated ones. That's what Pharisee means. Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word for separate. Okay? Um, they were the separated ones. Um, they were absolutely dead serious about living by the Bible. Now, let's stop here and say that is a good thing. That is a good thing. And for hundreds of years, they stood up for the truth. When Alexander the Great came into Israel and tried to Hellenize or Greekize all of the Jews and take away their religion, 
uh, many of these Pharisees took a stand even with their life. When the Romans came in, the Pharisees took a stand against the idolatry of the Romans and uh, won some successes there. In many ways, they were the heroes of the people. But the problem with the Pharisees is that they were so focused on outward obedience to God's word that they lost the plot. They were so focused on the outward aspects, the measurable aspects of the law of God that they forgot the inward aspects of the law of God. And while claiming to represent God, they forgot who God was and what God was all about. And in doing that, they took things that God meant to be a blessing for his people further than they were intended to go and hurt people and misrepresented God in the process. And so by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, the Pharisees and Jesus are going to butt heads a lot in the Gospels. He was their biggest, uh, they were his biggest human obstacle, and they were, uh, they were very much a part of him going to the cross. Well, here in this story, it says a huge contingent of these Pharisees have come into little Capernaum, okay? They've come to check Jesus out. And they have come from all over Israel. They've, they've come from all of the towns in Galilee. That would be the towns around where they were. But they've also come from Judea, which is hours, if not days, journey away. And some of them have even come from the big city of um, Jerusalem. So this would be like all uh, a group of preachers from all of Illinois, right? Southern Illinois, Northern Illinois, and even people from Chicago coming to some guy's house in Gaze uh, to, to check out a preacher. And what are they there for? They are there for one purpose. They are there to find something wrong with Jesus. That's what they're there for. Jesus is so popular, they need to knock Jesus off of his pedestal. That this can't be right, right? This can't be good that somebody is this popular. Kind of reminds me a few years ago, there was a, a revival. I don't think it was a legitimate revival, but there was a revival uh, going on at Asbury University in Kentucky, and it started to make the news. And you know what? Lots of preachers made the journey to Asbury, Kentucky, not to take part in this revival, but to find out what was wrong with it. And uh, that's what's going on here, okay? These Pharisees, uh, they are checking Jesus out. They're making sure that Jesus is legitimate. And everybody knows that. They're not hiding their purpose. Everybody in this room that Jesus is preaching to knows that there is a group of bigwigs here that are looking for something wrong with Jesus. So there's got to be tension in the room. It's like, you know, that's a pretty big elephant in the room, right? Jesus is preaching. It also tells us that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So there was something else in the air. There's an electricity in the air. They could feel the power of Jesus in that room. And in this charged atmosphere, we have one of the most memorable stories in the Bible. Four men are trying to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus. He can't get to Jesus by himself. He can't do anything by himself. He's paralyzed. Um, he, all he can do is lay in his bed. But he has these four friends who have heard about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus' power to heal. And they, they, they believe that Jesus will heal their friend. And so they carry their friend to this house where Jesus is teaching. There's a problem. Nobody's getting in this house. It's packed. It's packed like a bunch of clowns in a Volkswagen, right? I mean, it's, it's packed. So what do these friends do? Do they give up? Do they say, you know, today's not our day, bud. Maybe we'll come back another day when he's here. It's just not working for us. No, you know the story. They go up on the roof of the house. Now, you might say, not like our roofs. Um, you have to understand, in, in this place in Palestine, in Bible times, the roof was part of the living space. 
there would be stairs on the outside of the house going up to the roof, and they used their roof like a patio. It was like the, the entertain, a place where they would entertain people and do outdoorsy things on their roof, okay? And so these men, they, they take the, the, the guy up on top of the roof. They take his bed up on the roof. You know, I imagine them lifting the ground up. No, he's not here. No, he's here. You know, it's a stuff finder. You know, I don't know. I imagine them listening. They're trying to, they're trying to figure out where Jesus is. They're like, oh, he's pro- probably about right here. And then they start digging. You say, digging? Well, these roofs would be covered with grass. Literally grass growing on top of the roof. And underneath the grass would be about a foot of dirt. Underneath that foot of dirt would be about a foot of thatch. So like sticks and twigs and straw. And underneath that would be the beams that make up the ceiling of the house. And so these men, presumably without permission, start digging, I don't know, a three-foot by seven-foot hole in their roof, right? And I imagine this would have taken some time. I mean, this two feet of stuff they got to get out of there. It would have taken some time, and I imagine it was loud. Can you imagine, you know, in the we're in here, and all of a sudden you hear, everybody's like, what was that noise? And it's like, thump, thump. You know, you hear the, the dirt being thrown over, over and over again, and you hear these guys laughing and chuckling, and, you, and uh, dirt clods are falling through the, seer- the ceiling into people's beards and onto their heads. And uh, maybe the guys in the crowd, they're like, okay, maybe we should have listened to OSHA. Uh, <laughs> maybe the fire department occupancy limit was here for a reason, and this building's about to fall on us, and we're all going to die. And then... A hole opens up in the roof. I, I imagine small at first. Okay, that's how that would work. And sun starts to shine through, and there's a hole in the ceiling. Now, I don't imagine that Jesus kept teaching. Okay, because nobody was listening at that point. Uh, everybody looks up, and they look at this hole in the ceiling. The sun's shining through. There's dust. And uh, the hole gets bigger and bigger. And finally... A man on a cot, a man on a a litter is laid down, this paralyzed man, right at the foot of the teacher, right at the foot of Jesus. You would remember this if this happened to you. If you were in the crowd that day, this is one of those stories you would tell your kids, okay? Even if Jesus did nothing, this is a story you would have told your kids. And so Jesus is interrupted. He has this paralyzed man before him. You have a crowd of Pharisees, the bigwigs. What is this going on? What in the world? And everybody's wondering, what is Jesus going to do? And this is where Jesus throws a massive curveball. The story goes from strange to bizarre because Jesus does not say or do what everybody expects him to say or do. He doesn't do what everybody thinks he's going to do. He doesn't just touch the man and be like, okay, go, walk away, you're healed, let me go back to teaching. That's, that's not what Jesus does. He looks down at this paralyzed man, and he says, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. In Matthew and Mark, it says, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. What does that have to do with anything? Just think about it. This man is in a horrible situation. He's paralyzed he's unable to take care of himself he's unable to provide for his family and jesus is looking at him and saying your sins are forgiven i mean is this a time for theology there's two reasons for this the first reason i believe jesus said that is because the most important need of this man's life was to have his sins forgiven the most important need that all of us have is to have our sins forgiven and to have our relationship with God destroyed. This man was a sinner. Perhaps, we don't know, perhaps his sin led to his paralysis. Maybe he 
uh, was, was fooling around, and he got in an accident that left him paralyzed. That's happened to many people before. We don't know. Even if it wasn't what led to his paralysis, he was still a sinner living in his sin. Someone said, what would be the, what would be the use if Jesus healed this man and he used his legs to walk right into hell? He needed, to be, he needed to be healed of his sins. The second reason that Jesus did this, why he said your sins are forgiven, had to do with his audience. Remember, you have all these bigwigs, these doctors of the law, these Bible scholars, and they knew what that meant. You see, only God can forgive people's sins. They weren't wrong about that. Only God can forgive people's sins. And when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you, they said, hold up. Who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive people's sins. That is theologically inaccurate, unless he's God. All right? By the way, spoiler alert, he's God, okay? They were in an uproar over it. This was blasphemy to them. You know, this was, we're the rocks. Let's start stoning this guy. But then Jesus put them in a little bit of a pickle. Anybody could say, your sins are forgiven you. I mean, it would be foolish for them to say it in that culture, but anybody could say it. because You can't prove that, right? There's no visible sign of that. You can't see my relationship with God. But not anybody could touch a known paralyzed man and make him walk out of the room. And that's why Jesus said in verse 23, whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. He's asking them, what's easier? Forgiving sins or healing paralyzed people? They're both impossible. But here's the thing. He can do the impossible. He says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said them to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed or take up thy couch and go into thine house. So the man just gets up and he walks home and he's glorifying God. I'm going to interject here a little bit. You know what I think happened? I think he danced home. You would too. In fact, I think they were probably. I think all four, all four of the friends danced home. I think it was like a Bollywood movie. They were like, <laughs> they were just dancing and glorifying God. Okay, like David did, in uh, <laughs> in dancing before the Lord. What's the point? Why is this story recorded in the Bible for us? I think there's two reasons for this story. There's there's a, there's one point has two sides to it that I want to make this morning. Okay. First, the first point of this story is that Jesus has the, the power to forgive sins and heal broken lives. Jesus has the power to heal sins or forgive sins and heal broken lives. The second part of this story, the second reason, is that Jesus uses faith-filled, loving, motivated friends with compassion enough to bring others to him. That's what I think this story is about. So let's talk about each of those things for a second. First point, Jesus has the power to forgive sin and heal broken lives. The power to forgive sin and heal broken lives. That's what Jesus did here. He forgave a man's sins. He healed a man's broken life. Uh, Jesus wanted to demonstrate the ability to the Pharisees. He, he really wanted to show them that he was God incarnate, that he had the power to forgive sins. Why? So we would know he has the power to forgive sins. So the people in the audience would know he has the power to forgive sins because he has the power to forgive sins. And Jesus still has the power to forgive sins. 
And this is what Jesus came here to do. Matthew 121, the first mention of Christ, uh, the first mention of Jesus. You shall na name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, right? Um, the Apostle Paul said this near the end of his life. He said, 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, you know it, sinners. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Jesus came to the world to save not the righteous, not the religious, not the clean, but the sinners. Jesus came to chase the lost ones. He came to run after those that had run afoul of God's law and God's judgment. Romans 5, 6 through 8 puts it this way. It says, but when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to forgive those who were his enemies those who were living in sin in opposition to God. And you might think, okay, this whole religion thing, maybe I need to get my life right, maybe I need to do things right, and I'm going to come to God, and I'm going be, to become a, a Christian after I straighten my life out. That is not the way that it works. You come to God, He forgives you as a sinner, and then He puts your life together. OK, um, forgiveness comes before healing. The first thing that you need fixed, the first thing this man needed fixed was not this paralysis. It's not uh, the temporal position that you're in. It's your eternal position, your eternal relationship with God that's been marred by sin. And that has to be taken care of. And that was taken care of by the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, taking your sins on himself so that he can forgive you from your sins. Um, so the question is, have you come as a sinner to Jesus for forgiveness? Have you come to him knowing that you can't save yourself? Desperately needing his free salvation. You can no more get your sins forgiven you can no more live right with God than this paralyzed man could walk out with his couch before he met Jesus. Okay? You're helpless. Can you come to Jesus, accept the free gift that he's given you? That's the first thing Jesus wanted to do here, to show us that he could forgive sins, that he could heal this broken and paralyzed man. But there's a second part of this story that I think is just as important to mention. And that's this. Jesus used the friends. Jesus used the friends. Jesus used these faith-filled, loving, motivated friends. These friends that had compassion on him to bring others to him. And that's the way Jesus works today. Okay? Yes, Jesus has the power to heal sins, to heal lives, to forgive people. But you know what? In this age, in this dispensation, God has decided that the way he works is for others to bring people to him, for Christians to bring people to him. This poor paralyzed man could not bring himself to Jesus. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't get to Jesus. But he had friends that had faith. His friends believed that Jesus could heal him and would heal him. They had love. They didn't want to see their friend like this anymore. They didn't want to see him so helpless. They had determination. They were going to get their friend to Jesus. Even if they had to break the roof down, they were going to get their friend to Jesus. They had creativity. When everyone, everything else was stopped, they found a way. And listen, 
Today, Jesus has the power to heal people and save people from their sins and put lives back together. And we've all, we've all seen it, right? But God chooses to use people. God chooses to use us to bring others to him. My family, our story uh, in faith, our story in church started when um, a man that my stepfather worked with started talking to him at work about the gospel, okay? Somebody loved my stepdad enough. I hope it was over break, okay? Uh, not in the middle of talking to airplanes, but uh, somebody, somebody loved him enough to share the gospel with him, to sow that seed. And one day, uh, he woke up, and he went to church, and he accepted Jesus as a Savior. Okay, And our family was never the same again after that. My wife's family came to Christ when a man had enough compassion to go to the Whitfield County Jail in Georgia and witness to a rough inmate named Larry Stiles. And then when... Larry accepted Christ, he became his lifelong friend, and he discipled him. He didn't just, hey, this guy prayed a prayer in, in a prison cell. He loved him, okay? He brought him to Jesus. And I think the thing I want to tell you today is that you have friends. You have friends, maybe family members, maybe coworkers, that need the forgiveness that Jesus offers. They're paralyzed in their sins. Okay, you can't heal them. You're not God. You can't forgive their sins. You need to do your part in bringing them to Christ. And listen, that takes faith. You have to have faith. And this is where most people get it wrong. This is where most people, myself included, fail in our evangelism efforts. We fail to remember that Jesus wants to save people. And that he can save people. We think in our mind, oh, that person, they're too far gone. Oh, that person, they'd never come to Christ. Oh, does, does God even want to mess with those people? They had to have faith. They had to have strength. This was a, a difficult thing. Okay? It wasn't easy. And it's not easy to bring people to Christ. It takes determination. All right? When, when obstacles come up, when you're rebuffed, when... Uh, people uh, turn you down, all right? Our tendency, my tendency is the very first time somebody rebuffs me, I'm just like, okay, all right, okay? We, it, takes, it takes break down the ceiling determination sometimes to bring people to Christ. It takes love and compassion. As the book of Jude says, some have compassion making a difference. Right? It takes compassion. When we, when we go through the store and go to the restaurant, whatever we are, wherever we are, and we look at people and people are rough, people uh, are living in the effects of their sin, do we have the compassion of Christ for those people? Or do we look down on them like the Pharisees would have? This is the way God is choosing to work in the world today. The last, the last thing that Jesus gave his disciples was a commission to be a testimony, to be a witness, to preach the gospel to every creature. How can they hear, the book of Romans says, without a preacher? All right? Um, this is the way God chooses to work in this world. Are you going to be one of the four friends that love your friends, that love your family members, your coworkers? your neighbors enough to bring them to Jesus. So two lessons learned from this story. Number one, you're one of either two people here. Either you need to come to Jesus and experience uh, the forgiveness that he gives, or you already have, and you need to be like the four friends that bring others to him. Uh, that's, that's my message today. Let's stand together for invitation and prayer. All right, brother. Uh, Daniel, come and lead us in a song, if, if you would. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this story and how it speaks to us. And 
Lord, how memorable you made it. Um, you orchestrated and all that, no doubt. Lord, if there's someone here that's never received the forgiveness that you offer for their sins, I pray that today would be the day that they understand 